My name is Rafael de la Osa, I'm a professor in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health and Medicine in the Division of Occupational Medicine at uh, the Icon School of Medicine at Mansina here in New York. And I was asked to talk about, uh, present an overview of occupational lung diseases. All right, have no uh, relevant uh, financial conflict of interest to disclose. And I'll, uh, in this uh, overview, I'll try to describe the major types of occupational lung diseases. Of course, this is a very broad topic, and uh, but at least I'll, uh, I'll give an idea of uh, some of the uh, general principles. And I sent some further reading to the coordinator so that uh, is available. Um, to um, those attending. I'll describe the clinical approach to the diagnosis of occupational lung diseases and describe how this approach to treatment uh, of uh, these diseases differs in any ways from that of the non-occupational counterparts. So just to present the historical perspective very briefly, going back to antiquity, there were uh, descriptions of uh, trade-related diseases, even back to Hippocrates and Galen. And um, there was uh, perhaps the first uh, uh, acknowledged uh, uh, reference to uh, uh, occupational lung diseases was what was called minor's uh, thesis. Uh, and um, uh, Georg Bauer uh, uh, treatise of uh, uh, the metallic arts. That's what that translates. That was a, a book. And in 1567, the uh, so-called father of toxicology, Paracelsus, uh, also wrote on similar issues. Um, and uh, But perhaps he uh, acknowledged uh, seminal work in uh, occupational respiratory uh, diseases was uh, the uh, treatise uh, the, uh, of Bernardino Ramazzini in Italy of so, uh, uh, this book that was considered the first occupational um, medicine textbook. And uh, during the um, Enlightenment, uh, the encyclopedias uh, included uh, many references to these diseases from uh, occupation. So um, in a number uh, uh, of um, uh, factory acts in Great Britain during uh, Victorian era in particular, um, there were uh, mentions to these occupational diseases. And uh, in the late 1800s, uh, 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 they saw the development of workers' compensation systems in the main industrialized countries. Uh, in the United States, it proceeded state by state from 1911 and uh, curiously enough, Mississippi was the first one to 1948 um, in uh, the USA. And um, in 1969, uh, the uh, first specifically uh, occupational lung disease uh, uh, law, the Coal Mining Health and Safety Act, which is in, still in place, is, uh, 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 was uh, enacted in the United States. So. Uh, and then after that, for about 15 years, there were a, a, a large number of uh, laws that were enacted both for the um, environment and for uh, occupational uh, regulation. Uh, they are just listed here, um, concluding in 1986 with the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act, when it was recognized finally that asbestos was indeed uh, a cause of uh, occupational diseases. So uh, I want to just review some general principles that overarching principles for occupational and environmental, uh, environmentally induced lung diseases. Uh, toxic exposure may cause virtually every major clinical form of respiratory disease. So almost any defined lung disease may have an environmental cause. Uh, few environmental lung diseases will present with obvious pathognomonic features, and I'll review some of them just so you get a sense of uh, 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 some of those diseases that have um, idiosyncratic features, but the others uh, do not differ from the non-environmentally uh, uh, determined uh, counterparts. Now, the chronic sequela of a given exposure uh, cannot be predicted from the acute effects. That's another uh, important uh, 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 
altruism in uh, in this specialty. The acute and chronic effect of a given agent may be caused by entirely different mechanisms, and some of them are uh, only partially understood. Now, for acute diseases, there is usually a short and predictable time period between exposure and the resulting clinical manifestations that should suggest that such an association. But for chronic diseases, uh, long latency between uh, the first exposure and subsequent clinical manifestations is common. And that's why it is important in occupational, uh, or in obtaining an occupational history to really try to go back to the first uh, years of employment to past occupations where the exposure that may have determined the disease that is presently being uh, investigated in a particular patient uh, may be related to. And an important thing is that although we try to, uh, to obtain um, uh, some idea what the exposure dose was, uh, that exposure dose may determine the severity of the disease in an individual uh, patient, the incidence of disease among several individuals that were exposed, or the rapidity of the onset, but not necessarily all three. So you shouldn't expect that all three uh, are going to be determined, but you still need to get some sense of uh, what the intensity of the exposure was, even if it is just quantitatively, semi, uh, uh, non-quantitatively. So all environmentally induced lung diseases are preventable, and that's the reason why uh, it is important to identify them. And however, some chronic diseases may progress despite curtailment of the exposure to the offending agent. So sometimes they, when they are uh, diagnosed, it may be already too late, but it is still important because you will still be preventing disease in other individuals who may work in the same environment. Individual differences in susceptibility to exposures exist, and that is, uh, you are going to see it through your pulmonary series, that uh, uh, with any lung uh, toxin, uh, for example, tobacco is a great example of that, uh, not everyone is susceptible to the effect of tobacco. Everybody has a grandfather who was a chain smoker and never developed a clinical lung disease. But And the same happens with many of the occupational agents. Host susceptibility remains to be explained as, as, as actually rather poorly understood despite intense investigations, uh, but it is likely to include both genetic and epigenetic and other acquired factors. As I said, very poorly understood. The importance of making a diagnosis uh, of occupational lung disease is that it affects treatment and prognosis of an individual patient, has some legal and financial implications for the individual patient, and it helps identify a larger population at risk. So, and, uh, 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 you know, and in a larger perspective, it also contributes to research to disease type because in and of itself, these diseases end up being um, uh, uh, live experiments uh, uh, in the causation of a particular disease. So um, there are many classifications of occupational lung diseases. Uh, the oh, I'm just presenting a very brief and uh, uh, one, but it's just to underscore the fact that almost every type, every major pattern of lung disease that you are going to hear to your series can be caused by an occupational agent. So here we have chronic airway diseases, including asthma, chronic bronchitis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, uh, parenchymal diseases, pneumonitis, and alveolar disorders, and it can be uh, ARDS, uh, pulmonary alveolar lipoproteinosis, interstitial lung diseases, um, a large group of diseases that includes some uh, several uh, occupational and environmentally determined ones. Uh, lung cancer going all the way to malignancies and plural diseases, uh, either benign or malignant. So as you get, all what I wanted you to appreciate was that virtually every major pattern of lung disease can have an occupational cause. And that is the reason why um, in your differential diagnosis, uh, you need to include that as a possibility and try to obtain in your uh, past uh, medical history, uh, an occupational history. So 
Uh, the clinical approach to uh, occupational lung diseases can be summarized as uh, 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 in three major uh, points. Uh, one, the, the, the first, the physiopathologic evaluation and characterization of signs and symptoms, as you would do with any uh, uh, potential respiratory disease. Uh, then you try to establish the etiology. And in the case of, if you are thinking of occupational one, you try to review all potential exposures, document those that may be most relevant, uh, and assess the biological plausibility in terms of getting an idea of what the dose may have been, of that the latency may have been, and other associated phenomena. And uh, of course, reasonably exclude competing causes because uh, in those differential diagnoses, as you well know, there are uh, many several diseases to include. So in the evaluation of exposures, uh, uh, you start by obtaining a complete uh, job and exposure history. So you uh, both ask the type of jobs that the person may have uh, uh, performed and ask the, the person if uh, they were exposed to vapors, dust, ga gases, fumes, and that uh, mnemonic uh, VGDF vapors, gas, dust, and fume, I think is helpful to the uh, generalists to really try to elicit uh, a history of um, uh, some potential exposures from uh, uh, the individual patients. Uh, there, uh, you, there, there can be a review of the what are called the material safety data sheets, which uh, uh, every employee in the United States is entitled to being able to obtain. You as a physician actually can uh, 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 request those safety data sheets from the hospital where you work, just to give you an idea, you are no exception to this law. Uh, you try to get a sense of the epidemiologic pattern, uh, 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 when the symptoms uh, get worse during the week uh, uh, and better when, when away from work, whether there are other workers in the uh, environment that may be similarly affected. You try to see if there's a possibility of uh, performing a workplace evaluation. And usually this is done by the occupational specialist, uh, sometimes with industrial hygienists uh, to try to uh, get a sense of that and um, obtain health records from employer or from the union, um, data from OSHA inspections, because these are public documents, so they are available upon request uh, from uh, everyone, and particularly physicians, and markers of exposure in clinical material if, if, if it is possible for some of these. One important consideration that I wanted to get out, if I don't say anything um, uh, uh, through this talk, is uh, the uh, importance of uh, keeping this scheme of a hierarchy of occupational exposure control measures. And uh, just to underscore the fact that unlike uh, what most people think about uh, personal protective equipment, those are the lowest priorities and the least effective methods to control for exposure, the best one is the elimination, if at all possible, of the hazard. Um, the uh, lower uh, uh, level is what is called substitution. So if there is a, a, a material that is hazardous, you try to find one that can be uh, substituted uh, and th they try to uh, that way mitigate the um, the potential uh, uh, hazard of the first one. Hopefully the second one doesn't pose any additional or similar uh, hazards as it, it sometimes happened uh, in the past. The uh, le le next level of uh, exposure control is what's called engineering controls. And those are related to ventilation, uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, devices to, for example, using wet methods when there is a very dusty uh, environment. The other one, the next one is administrative controls, uh, rotations, uh, 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 it's isolation measures, for example, in the hospital. And as I said, the last one uh, is personal protective equipment because uh, it is uh, uh, very difficult to uh, 
uh, next to impossible uh, in the presence of a hazardous situation, uh, first to have complete uh, 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 safety uh, with uh, uh, mask and other uh, devices, but also to uh, make a worker wear them continuously during an entire shift and every day at work. So this is uh, this hierarchy of exposure controls applies to virtually every occupational disease, not just respiratory. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, some of the aspects that I have discussed uh, uh, pertain to specialists in occupational medicine. In the state of New York, there is um, a, a, a Department of Health, New York State Department of Health Occupational Clinic Network. Uh, it's about has about eight or nine different uh, uh, clinics, uh, and you can find out uh, about them in uh, the uh, Department of Health uh, 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 website, and that's their, their telephone as well. And uh, at the national level, uh, there is an association of occupational and environmental clinics, most of which are based at academic centers, and uh, it's AOEC, and you can find it again at, the, at their webpage. And just so you know, at the very local level, you at, uh, at, at your hospital, uh, uh, in, in Staten Island, uh, there is, Mansina has a, 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 a center for occupational health and, uh, and it's actually uh, a, a joint venture with uh, uh, Richmond University Medical Center. So just so the uh, contact information is there. So there's always a, a way to have uh, a resource uh, uh, a, a nearby practice. So um, work-related asthma is, I'm going to present some examples of occupational respiratory diseases. And um, uh, this is uh, considered the most frequent occupational respiratory diseases in the uh, developed countries. And um, uh, as you know, asthma uh, developed from an interaction between host factors, most likely genetically determined and environmental factors that they may be non-occupational like pollen and different allergens. And some of them are completely unknown and occupational factors. And then they drive an inflammatory uh, 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 process in the airway uh, that has a certain number of characteristics. It has allergic pathways, uh, T lymphocyte activated uh, mechanisms that eventually lead to uh, the structural and functional changes that make asthma recognition uh, they are listed here. Um, they are uh, very well documented. Uh, and uh, the functional changes uh, in lung functions, such as, as classic the reversible airway obstruction and bronchial hyperreactivity, that uh, interact uh, amongst themselves uh, and produce the symptoms of the patient. So the same happens, of course, with the occupational diseases. So no, it's no surprise that occupational asthma clinically is very similar to non-occupational asthma. Um, this is a, 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 an illustration. It's now about 10 years old, but more or less uh, remains uh, fairly uh, valid about the interaction between uh, occupational agents, if they are uh, high molecular weight, like proteins, uh, they may be lower uh, uh, molecular weight, but in general, they uh, trigger uh, uh, a cascade of interactions at the cellular level with T lymphocytes that differentiate into uh, what uh, are uh, called uh, uh, Th1 or Th2, and the Th2 drives uh, these interleukins that inter uh, interact with the uh, B cells, the B lymphocytes, eventually uh, releasing um, uh, in immunoglobulins E and G, and uh, which cause the granulation of the mast cells. So these pathways, the very classic one of the allergens, uh, and that happens in the occupational uh, uh, environment, but also there is the irritant induced one where there is epithelial damage and oxidative stress, and there are some reactive oxygen species, uh, neutrophilic inflammation, but somehow this pathway eventually also converges with these other one, so the manifestations may end up being similar, 
but the way they originate and the uh, how the gas gauge uh, uh, proceeds is different between the two. So these are the two major types of occupational asthma that are recognized, sensitizer induced and the irritant induced. So if we have some definitions of work-related asthma, is asthma that began or worsened in relation to an environmental exposure at the workplace. Uh, the types of work-related uh, work asthma are, are recognized are first what is really called occupational asthma and work exacerbated asthma. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, if the occupational asthma is caused by a sensitizer, there's usually a latency period between the exposure and the onset of symptoms. However, when it's irritant induced, for example, a spill, uh, uh, ammonia, chlorine, uh, an agent that is uh, potently irritant, there's usually no latency period. It's within hours the, and the patient uh, uh, experiences the onset of symptoms. Uh, work exacerbated asthma is increasingly recognized and refers to the fact of pre-existing asthma that the work environment exacerbates in a significant way. And I'll, I'll refer to that in a, in a few. It is probably more frequent than occupational asthma particularly in the United States. So there are a number of other conditions that are similar to asthma, uh, and that is uh, their status is not completely, uh, uh, sometimes it's well understood or well studied, like in the case of cotton dust induced airway disease, that's called vicinosis, uh, of which we see uh, less uh, these days in the United States, but it is seen in other parts of the, of the country. Uh, the Walter Center dust associated airway diseases uh, have some features of occupational asthma, uh, but in some cases uh, it differs um, and I, I won't belabor that, that point uh, right now. And uh, organic dust um, has long been uh, associated with asthma-like disorders, but they are really not, uh, they don't uh, completely meet all the uh, diagnostic criteria. So they are kind of a cross between chronic bronchitis and asthma clinically. Uh, a large number of agents, uh, more than 300, uh, have been associated with possession of asthma in the workplace. And I just to very briefly, of course, there are more than 300, as I said, but the larger groups to remember in case of, you know, uh, uh, is uh, when there are uh, animal or insect derived antigens, for example, uh, working with laboratory animals or working with casein and other proteins that are out of animal origin, they can be allergenic. Uh, exposure to uh, plants, uh, woods, vegetable uh, gum, there are many wood dust that have been associated with uh, occupational asthma. In industry, biological enzymes are extensively used, and I'll just give you a, a uh, an example, for example, uh, is in the case of the enzymes that are used to enhance uh, detergents that are used for laundry, uh, they uh, use an, a, a wide variety of enzymes that were uh, very well documented to cause occupational asthma. But in other uh, pharmaceutical processes, uh, they are also used. Metals, including cobalt, tungsten, carbide, so metal uh, like platinum and nickel, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, this is in the manufacturer of your you know, zillion uh, for uh, uh, antibiotics, um, et cetera. Amines like uh, ethanol and ethylene amines, aromatic amines, uh, colophony used in, in, in soldering. And there is also a, a mixed bag of other chemicals, usually low molecular weight uh, ones, like isocyanates, aldehydes, chloramine, ammonia. Etc. These are very important, and isocyanates. Uh, this is a maybe a board eligible question. Uh, is, for example, using car paint spraying, uh, they as these are the uh, considered still the leading uh, cause of occupational asthma in higher income countries, industrialized countries like uh, uh, in the United States and Western Europe. So isocyanates. Uh, so um, 
there are, uh, you know, in practice, we keep lists of these agents or you use internet based listings to try to keep track of, uh, uh, particularly when there is an agent that is uh, uh, less frequent. And, uh, but I, I would caution that in general, the controversy about uh, 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 occupational asthma uh, relates to the fact uh, that many of these 300 or so agents are highly infrequent or cluster in certain areas of the world. Uh, some agents may have a mix or uh, the pathogenic mechanism is completely unknown. Uh, the list keeps uh, enlarging, getting uh, bigger and more uh, as more irritants and sensitizers are introduced in the industry. And um, exposure to more than one sensitizer and, or irritant it can happen in a particular workplace. So there's no sometimes one-to-one -one relation. Uh, some occupations uh, 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 present uh, the risk of exposure to more than one hazard. And uh, uh, it has to be admitted that some of these, the documentation for some of these associations has sometimes been limited for at least some of the agents to case reports, case series. So it has not um, uh, reached the level of evidence that would be ideal to have. So uh, it is a kind of work in progress in, in a way. So in the case of work exacerbated asthma, as I mentioned, it's a different type, it's a different situation. It is when you have somebody who has a confirmed and well-known uh, previous diagnosis of asthma that predates the entry into the particular workplace that you're investigating and that experiences an association uh, between asthma symptom intensity and the uh, work uh, situation. And um, it, usually in the form of increased symptoms or increased medication requirements uh, in that particular occupational exposure setting. And it is a work exacerbated asthma is very likely more common than occupational asthma. And uh, amongst the recognized uh, asthma aggravating factors that you should take into account in the evaluation of your regular asthmatic patient is whether there is exposure to dust, exposure to irritant chemicals, uh, temperature extremes, uh, extreme heat or extreme cold. As you know, the airways are sensitive uh, to uh, reactivity uh, 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 I mean, to those agents in the form of uh, increased reactivity, uh, poor indoor air quality in general, and or physically strenuous work that may trigger exercise-induced asthma, for example, in some individuals. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, occupational asthma is the most frequent occupational respiratory disease reported in developed or high income countries, estimated to account for anywhere between six to 15% of adult onset asthma cases in developed countries. And it has a particularly high prevalence in the metal construction, rubber, plastic work, and printing industry, and also industrial cleaning. For, for example, in the healthcare uh, sector, uh, we see it in individuals exposed to agents that are used for uh, disinfection and uh, sterilization, like glutaraldehyde, formaldehyde, et cetera. And just so you uh, see an example that is not so far from your current occupation. So, um, and uh, the exposure in this country uh, prevalence uh, to occupational asthma causing agent has been established, although this is a uh, literature that is now uh, about a quarter century old, uh, a, at about 8% of the working population in the United States is uh, exposed to uh, uh, agents uh, that can cause asthma. So uh, exposure is the most important determinant in the development of a occupational asthma, and that's why your uh, history is really of paramount importance. Uh, atopy may be a risk factor, but it's poorly predictive uh, even of sensitizer-induced asthma. So that doesn't mean that a, an atopic individual cannot work uh, in, a, in an environment like that. Uh, where there is a, a exposure to potential occupational asthma genes. Uh, smoking you would, uh, is not really so much a risk factor, 
but it, it may uh, affect the severity uh, of um, sensitizers during the use of asthma. There are some studies uh, you know, that suggested that, but again, uh, it's not uh, a deterministic association by any stretch. The same happened with bronchial hyperreactivity. And it is thought that there may be some predisposing genes. There was some investigation about a variety of them, but really uh, uh, nothing has been established uh, with certainty. I won't um, uh, uh, go in detail into this uh, scheme that goes from the initial suspicion to preliminary and confirmatory evaluation all the way to management. I only wanted to uh, emphasize the fact that in the management of uh, occupational asthma cases, besides the clinical approach, according to whatever the guidelines are uh, at the moment, uh, there is there has to be intervention at the level of the work environment uh, uh, that in most cases, in, uh, in the, uh, particularly in sensitizer-induced uh, sensitizer cases, in, implies removal because uh, even uh, very small amounts of the agent can cause the symptoms. And uh, also uh, uh, there, uh, there are measures to, you know, to try to decrease exposure. Uh, and uh, importantly, uh, the public health and legal uh, implications like workers' compensation, notification of public health agencies. New York State has a reporting scheme for occupational respiratory diseases and the notification of the employer and or co-workers as applicable. So in order to prevent uh, further uh, disease in this environment. I'm going to switch uh, then to another uh, 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 common respiratory disease that you uh, uh, are very familiar with, I'm sure, with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, just to mention that besides tobacco and cigarette smoke, a number of other um, occupational dust and chemicals and indoor, outdoor, and, uh, and outdoor air pollution have been recognized uh, as contributing to the ideology of COPD uh, throughout the world. And this particular cartoon, it should be, uh, I should have added the credit, this actually comes straight from the gold guidelines uh, for COPD. So this is a very well-recognized factor that although cigarette smoke accounts for over 80, 85 percent of the concession of uh, COPD, there are a number of other contributors that um, can, uh, 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 if they are removed or controlled, could mitigate the impact of this disease on uh, any population. And this has been documented throughout the world, not just in the United States. Again, going to the scheme, and then not to be surprised, since for COPD, as was the case for asthma, there is an interaction between uh, host factors, environmental factors leading to inflammation. Uh, in this case, the inflammation is different from that of uh, asthma. There is oxidative stress, probably protease, anti-protease imbalance, and a number of cellular mediated uh, inflammatory mechanism by uh, neutrophils, macrophages, and T lymphocyte, leading to structural changes and functional changes that are distinct from those of asthma. There is alveolar destruction in the case of COPD, not in the case of asthma. Um, there are uh, distal airway dilatation that, that's in the case and leading to eventually to emphysema and um, functional changes uh, that uh, are lack the reversibility of asthma and um, it, there is airflow limitation, but only with uh, some partial or no reversibility at all. So you will review that uh, in your lecture about COPD, but I just wanted to uh, underscore the fact that it is uh, very similar for the occupational um, uh, counterpart. So, um, this was a review um, that is already a little bit dated, but it actually has not lost um, validity. It was excellent published in Lancet uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, where the authors uh, reviewed uh, non-smoking risk factors associated with COPD. They are listed here, indoor and outdoor air pollution, occupational exposures, and there, is a, there are a variety of uh, settings, uh, crop farming, anim, animal farming, 
uh, dust exposures like in coal mining, uh, in gold mining, hard rock mining, tunneling, concrete manufacturing, construction, you see all of these, iron is still found in chemical exposures like in plastic, textile, rubber industries, uh, leather and food product manufacturing. And uh, in uh, special uh, environments where there is pollutant uh, exposure, like in transportation and trucking, uh, automotive repair. Uh, and so those are uh, amongst the uh, non-smoking uh, risk factors uh, associated with causation of COPD. So uh, the population attributable risk of occupational exposures as causes of COPD, uh, it has been estimated at about uh, 15%, uh, and, uh, but it varies from country to country and, uh, and it's it been studied in some developing countries actually higher than that. At the individual level, it may be difficult to establish occupational causality for some exposures, particularly when there is co-exposure with cigarette smoking, which is not infrequent. Uh, so, but that in a way doesn't exclude the possibility uh, of the, in, in fact, uh, it may be perfectly uh, plausible that uh, the occupational exposures have made some contribution. And so it should not be uh, excluded uh, at all in, a, in, a, in, a, in somebody who has a smoking history. So um, I, I, achieving complete prevention of COPD, as you can appreciate, uh, should be within reach. You know, if you remove these environmental exposures, if you uh, uh, lead to uh, uh, tobacco uh, cessation and even prevention. I'm going to switch gear now to uh, the pneumoconiosis of which you may have heard and just to give you some examples of those. Uh, instead of airway diseases, as I've covered up to now, I'll go to more parenchymal uh, uh, diseases. And they are um, uh, a number of disorders that are caused by inhalation of dust or fibers and characterized by inflammatory changes that usually uh, initiate uh, or take place in the uh, pulmonary interstitial space. So um, the disease incidence is usually proportional to dose intensity uh, 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 in, in broad terms. Uh, relatively high dose is needed to produce disease. So usually very trivial uh, uh, exposures may uh, not lead to disease. Uh, it is very common that there is a long latency between the time from the first exposure to the disease onset. And it can be of many, uh, of several decades, one to three decades, if not, are not unusual. And fibrosis is a typical uh, common denominator of these conditions. And presently, there are no available uh, effective treatments once interstitial fibrosis has been established. So amongst the fibrogenic minerals, dust and fibers, I'll just mention some of the uh, 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 best known ones, uh, uh, silicon dioxide, silica, uh, coal, dust and carbonaceous uh, materials. And then there's a variety of silicates, uh, which we can divide uh, into asbestos or asbestiform types, like as asbestos itself, or the non-asbestos silicates like talc and kaolin, mica, and there are others. But these are the major fibrogenic uh, uh, materials. These are uh, less frequent, and like and and they have some uh, very uh, colorful names, and sometimes. Uh, requires uh, uh, mineralogical uh, uh, expertise to really try to establish. And they may be silicates like uh, these two that I listed here at the end, but they are much less frequent. Uh, and and th there are also some uh, minerals that although they deposit in the lung, they don't elicit much of a fibrogenic reaction. And the classic one is iron that um, produces a very abnormal uh, 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 imaging studies of the chest, but actually very little lung disease and it's, uh, you know, cirrhosis, stenosis is this uh, a similar situation. So, um, 
So let, let's just we, uh, then move on to a few of the examples of the pneumoconiosis and the most, the most frequent uh, amongst them. So the coal dust, uh, lung disease, or uh, uh, just to, uh, or coal workers pneumoconiosis, is caused by the inhalation of coal dust and other carbonaceous uh, compounds. Uh, so it's characterized by the um, formation of lung nodules and focal emphysema. And the, uh, of course, it occurs in coal mining, but also in foundry work in carb carbon black manufacturing. Um, it is, uh, of course, uh, the pathogenesis involves the inhalation of the dust, the deposition of the dust at the level of the respiratory bronchioles. Those are the bronchioles, distal bronchioles that lack any um, uh, cartilage. Um, and uh, in their uh, wall, the phagocytosis by, and there, there are <clears throat> uh, alveolar ducts already uh, branching out from them. So there is some gas exchange in some respiratory bronchioles. And uh, that's why they are called that way. And there's this phagocytosis by alveolar macrophages and by a number of mechanisms that are not fully understood. Uh, there is activation of inflammatory mediators that eventually leads to remodeling of the lung with formation of the classic uh, 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 coal macules. They are in, uh, uh, and I'll show a, a, a micrograph in a few uh, minutes. So there are a number of progression factors, uh, of course, uh, but one important one that I wanted to underscore was that the severity of coal workers pneumoconiosis actually tends to uh, be markedly enhanced by the presence of uh, silica in the coal dust. Because of course, as you can imagine, when you mine coal, you're not only uh, 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 getting uh, coal from the, uh, the the coal seam, but they're all, you're also uh, blasting the rock that is uh, made up of quartz and silicon dioxide. And the more quartz there is in, in that uh, particular mine, uh, the more severe the disease is. Uh, tuberculosis is a, a comorbidity or a complication of some of the pneumoconiosis like coal workers and silica uh, uh, induced lung diseases and a factor uh, accelerated the progression of the disease or the clinic enhancing the clinical severity. And uh, there are as, as usual individual susceptibility factors that are not very well understood. So in the histopathology, the classic is the finding of the coal macules and, and nodules, they are usually less, the nodules are less fibrous and organized than those of silicosis. Again, I'll show some of that. And there surrounding them, there is, uh, uh, there are areas of focal emphysema and the position of extensive deposition of, of dust along septal lines, uh, but not a, a lot of fibrosis unless, uh, as I said, there is a silica uh, in the, um, in, in uh, deposition in the lung. And there are some variants that uh, uh, like progressive massive fibrosis and rheumatoid uh, called lung. So the clinical forms of cold uh, uh, workers pneumoconiosis is simple disease when the nodules are less than one centimeter and clinically there is minimal or uh, or no uh, functional abnormality. In complicated disease is what we call progressive massive fibrosis. And the nodules exceed uh, one centimeter in diameter. And uh, there, uh, there, there tends to be uh, uh, lung function abnormalities, more so in the more severe progressive massive fibrosis. Uh, rheumatoid cold pneumoconiosis is when there is, uh, the nodules are usually variable. And in this particular condition, they, they, they can cavitate. That's not very common in this disease unless there's either tuberculosis or rheumatoid uh, arthritis as a coexisting disease. And um, so the diagnosis, uh, you have to document the occupational exposure. Again, the radiology is helpful, the histopathology. And uh, uh, as, as, as is the case with all occupational respiratory medicine, exclude competing causes of disease. So this is how the respiratory, a respiratory bronchial looks when there is deposition of coal dust uh, along in the wall. And there is uh, already the, a, a, a fibrotic reaction 
on the wall of these uh, 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 respiratory bronchial. I'm showing it here with these uh, co collagenous uh, tissue uh, surrounding the wall of the uh, and deforming the respiratory bronchial and the macules as in the interstitium, you see this deposit again of pigment. Of course, a mac mac macroscopically, you see extensive uh, coal dust deposition and very, uh, th th this is a, 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 an, an X-ray that shows some uh, nodular disease, very faint, very fuzzy, and some linear increased li linear density, but again, generally uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, subtle. And I, I have here a, a, a comparison between a normal, a simple uh, uh, cold workers pneumoconiosis and a case with progressive uh, massive fibrosis, where you can see uh, what I mean with the uh, relatively uh, low level of abnormality in simple cold workers pneumoconiosis and how severe it can get when these uh, nodules is, start enlarging and coalescing into larger nodules and uh, masses, essentially, like these ones here. So that's what is progressive massive fibrosis. So uh, CAT scan, of course, uh, makes things easier in terms of recognition. And here you see some of these macules. Uh, you see how they are fuzzy. They are not uh, sharply defined. Um, they are less than one centimeter. They tend to be more in the right upper uh, lobe, um, posterior uh, air, uh, predominance, and they are throughout the lung. And there is associated focal emphysema next to these uh, nodules usually. So you see areas of emphysema. So you see how uh, exposure to coal dust is amongst the potential causes for uh, uh, COPD, and you can recognize it here. But um, uh, also, um, in an RCT scan, if you are, uh, go more detailed, you can see areas of honeycombing, uh, of which you will hear in your interstitial lung disease lecture, and the areas of emphysema, again, at the basis of the lung. You can see it uh, there, and it's a, a, a coal worker's uh, pneumoconiosis case. In the last um, decade or two decades, there has been a, a sharp increase in the uh, incidence of coal workers' pneumoconiosis in the United States, and that is thought to relate primarily to uh, deregulation, a smaller mine operations, and higher content of silica in the uh, coal seams. So uh, all the leading in some cases to the need for lung transplant for some of these cases that are very severe. So I'll uh, switch uh, on that to the silica dust related lung diseases. Uh, they are caused by inhalation of crystalline silica dust, which is silicon dioxide and is characterized by interstitial fibrosis and formation of nodules. Uh, silica has different uh, uh, presentations in nature. Uh, it can be crystalline or it can be amorphous. Uh, when it's crystalline, the most common uh, is uh, 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 forms are listed here uh, with quartz uh, being as a particularly uh, fibrogenic one, the same for crystobalite. Um, a large variety of occupations uh, uh, involve exposure to crystalline uh, silica, of which mining is just one of them. But remember glass manufacturing, the manufacturing of abrasives, um, boiler scaling, uh, 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 abrasive blasting, uh, the manufacture or use of silica fillers is, is, is used as a, uh, in many, uh, for example, in toothpaste, if you, uh, uh, you didn't know, is actually about 40% uh, silica dust. So, uh, of course, it, uh, it's, it's not being inhaled, so it tends not to cause any problem, but it's just so you see how even some very common products uh, are uh, 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 you utilize silica. So the risk is not for you as the user of toothpaste, but of the uh, worker who is employed in the manufacturing of uh, those products and other dental products. Silicosis is the most common occupational lung disease in developing countries.
And here we have an example of why these diseases happen. Uh, this is a, a, a worker that is definitely using a hard hat you know, uh, and is protecting his eyes, but certainly has no respiratory protection whatsoever for the dust that the sowing of these uh, 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 granite uh, uh, slab uh, it, it is produced here in this operation. So this, uh, I won't belabor the issue of the cascade, as I said, that leads to the inflammation and the fib fib fibrotic uh, process, because I wanted to show you a little bit how it looks like it and how you can, can contrast it with the one with coal dust, where you see these very intense fibrogenic reaction. These are layers, onion-like layers of uh, collagen. Uh, with a cellular uh, environment around it, uh, but uh, this is the intense type of reaction of the siliconic nodules. So uh, early, you can uh, you may not notice it, mostly in some inflammatory cells, but they quickly develop in these very intensely uh, fibrotic nodules. Uh, the x-ray, the radiology is again, nodular disease, some linear densities, uh, and in more severe disease or more uh, in the complicated form of the disease, like with cold uh, dust, you see the uh, uh, coalescence and uh, the formation of these uh, masses uh, uh, leading to progressive massive fibrosis. So CT scan again makes it easier to recognize and you see the nodular disease uh, scattered throughout the lungs, right? Uh, they are harder. You see that more defined than those coal workers. And um, uh, uh, it, that's a case of simple silicosis, multiple nodules, uh, less than one centimeter in diameter. They tend to give uh, uh, my, relatively mild symptoms that are uh, minimal or no physiologic abnormalities. And here is... Um, a case, another case where you see again the nodular disease. There are some linear uh, reticular uh, 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 opacities uh, and perhaps a little bit of traction uh, bronchiectasis or bronchiectasis uh, in the upper lobe with some loss of volume that you can appreciate better in the sagittal, in the coronal uh, reconstruction here, uh, where the uh, upper lobes have lost uh, some volume. And in fact, they uh, uh, pull the uh, main, uh, main stem bronchi upwards. So uh, this is another case, simple silicosis. It was a, a tunnel uh, digger uh, and Oh, I wanted to show you uh, in this example because it shows how even though it's a predominantly simple silicosis, there is already this coalescence of uh, uh, nodules here that uh, eventually uh, can progress to uh, the larger masses that I showed you before. And uh, one important thing that silicosis does not produce uh, 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 real pleural plaques, but however, when there are subpleural uh, nodules and they coalesce, as they, uh, they does here, it can produce a pattern or uh, an image that is, uh, is some people call pseudo plaques or uh, that suggests uh, pleural thickening, but it's due to the coalescence of parenchymal uh, subpleurally located uh, nodules. So uh, this is another case of simple silicosis. It is a, a case of dental technician, somebody who is in the uh, manufacturing of uh, dental products. And uh, there's multinodular disease with essentially minimal or trivial confluence of those uh, nodules. So in complicated silicosis, is when there have been coalesces of the long nodules into conglomerates that exceed one centimeter in diameter and may evolve if severe enough into progressive massive fibrosis. In those, in progressive massive fibrosis, the masses are usually two, three centimeters, five centimeters in diameter. They are really large and, um, and usually bilateral. And um, so uh, other uh, uh, findings in chest imaging includes uh, 
these nodules are usually non-cavitated and uh, silicosis can cause eggshell lymph node calcification. I'm going to show you that in a moment. They are not pathognomonic of silicosis, but it's one of the most frequent causes of that particular pattern. And um, the, uh, uh, these masses can cause bronchovascular amputation and distortion areas of bronchiectasis, antelectasis. People tend to be fairly symptomatic. And because of the traction of the lung upwards uh, towards the uh, upper lobes, there are bullous changes, usually in the lower lung zones that look uh, like, like blebs, like the ones that you see in severe emphysema. But as I say, the plural changes are usually caused by uh, coalescence of nodules in the subpleural location. Again, this is the case of progressive massive fibrosis. You see the large uh, diameter uh, uh, masses, again, intensely uh, fibrotic in a concentric way. And here's an example of this progressive massive fibrosis and some of the subpleural nodules that can give the appearance sometimes of pleural uh, abnormalities. Uh, uh, not infrequently, these masses uh, have calcification, as you see here in these two. And also, this is uh, to uh, show you uh, some mediastinal and hilar lymph nodes that have the classic eggshell uh, calcification. Uh, sarcoidosis can also do this, uh, but not so frequently. So, uh, but silicosis. Uh, uh, does it a little bit more often, but again, do not ex uh, the, uh, expect to see this in every case of silicosis. So here again, more cases of progressive massive fibrosis from silicosis. You see here uh, some uh, plural uh, reactive uh, uh, thickening, uh, linear stranding uh, and traction, um, and more of the same progressive massive fibrosis with conglomerates and cavitation is not very frequent. And when you see it in the case of silicosis, you may uh, suspect that, that there may be coexistent tuberculosis. You should know that uh, silicosis is a risk factor for tuberculosis with uh, uh, an enhanced uh, uh, incidence uh, that uh, mimics that of HIV is actually quite important in South Africa. Um, the triple threat of HIV, tuberculosis, and silicosis uh, is uh, uh, rampant, for example, amongst minors. So um, uh, sometimes the PET scan can be uh, 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 quite active, and some of these masses sometimes are confused uh, with uh, cancers. Uh, this is a, a case that I, a, a dental factory worker, that uh, minimal smoking history and was constantly being investigated at three uh, uni uh, teaching hospitals in New York City uh, for cancer, although he has bilateral disease. And as I said, was not much of a smoker, then uh, only like two pack years or something like that. And um, uh, he had asthma, was uh, uh, admitted to the ICU, and the attending in the ICU uh, decided to uh, take advantage of the situation of uh, con the control situation of the patient to do a needle biopsy and demonstrated that this was silicosis. Accelerated silicosis is just a, a, a more uh, rapid form of the disease in people who are very intensely exposed, exposed to silica. And uh, there's also a rheumatoid uh, variant of uh, silica uh, pneumoconiosis. And uh, in the United States, uh, in the area of Appalachia, and uh, in New England, in uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, uh, and also in the Southwest, in the mining states like Arizona, Colorado, uh, Nevada, uh, there tend to be more cases of silicosis um, uh, than we see here. So for asbestos, um, I'm just going to mention 
that um, there are several patterns of disease. Um, that can be parenchymal disease with asbestosis, pleural disease with effusion, plaques, diffuse pleural fibrosis or rounded atelectasis, or neoplastic diseases. Uh, that can be bronchogenic uh, carcinoma or mesothelioma. So uh, not all of them are coexistent, and in fact, they may appear separately. Uh, somebody, the majority of people may only have isolated pleural plaques and not necessarily as interstitial uh, lung disease, which is what asbestosis is. So uh, the term asbestosis should be reserved for the interstitial uh, pattern of uh, disease. And it's, uh, asbestosis is a long latency disease, 10 to 20 years are typical, sometimes longer than that. And uh, in a few cases, the uh, changes may not be detected by chest radiograph. And in this day and age with CAT scans, uh, it's uh, really impossible to miss. And uh, this is a CAT scan of an individual. Uh, and you see that he has a pattern that is not very dissimilar to that of interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. He has the uh, usual interstitial pneumonia pattern with traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis uh, and reticular changes. Uh, not so much ground glass, a little bit, but not so much. And um, But for all intents and purposes, it looks like uh, 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 interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, some people uh, require that there be pleural plaques as a evidence of uh, ex asbestos exposure, but not everybody agrees on that. So, uh, so, so this is again the interstitial uh, thickening uh, in, in the lung with the, uh, the ob observation of these um, uh, ferruginous uh, bodies that are fibers. Another example with the thickening of the interstitium compared to the normal uh, 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 alveolar walls, the ferruginous bodies that can be uh, seen in this disease. And plural disease in the form of thickening, and this is the, how it looks. Uh, and it can be calcified, you see, in, uh, in, like this one here. All right, and um, again, uh, the latency is 10 or more years of, uh, uh, after initial exposure, usually symptomatic, practically no uh, 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 evidence of uh, functional uh, impairment. And that's um, other examples by CAT scan here. They are, tend to be very close to uh, the, the ribs, uh, as you can observe can be calcified or not. And when it's diffused, it's usually the visceral pleura that is um, uh, 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 affected. And here's a case of rounded atelectasis. It's like a swirl of, uh, of, of pleural thickening involving the parenchyma. And again, uh, 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 asbestos is associated with uh, mesothelioma and lung cancer, both. So um, here's just to show it's the same as the pleural plaque, but we're way more uh, uh, extensive. And uh, you see the thickening quite significant and extensive, you know, um, usually not calcified. This is another example. So, and bronchogenic carcinoma. And just to remember that asbestos and uh, cigarette smoking have uh, a multiplicative um, uh, 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 effect on the uh, incidence of lung cancer. So these are classic numbers from Selikov uh, here at Mount Sinai, where asbestos increased the risk of lung cancer by five in the absence of tobacco. Tobacco in the absence of asbestos increases the uh, incidence uh, by about a, a 10 or 11. And then when the two of them are combined is the cross product, that is the classic synergism in epidemiological terms. So uh, here are the causes of occupational lung cancer. I won't have time to review them. I uh, distributed uh, an article with the review uh, of, 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 of the uh, occupational carcinogen, lung carcinogens according to the International Agency uh, for Research on Cancer. Uh, and you can see that asbestos and silica are here. Uh, some metals uh, like beryllium and nickel, diesel exhaust, 
polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Nobody's going to be surprised about that, ionizing radiation. But there are also some occupations that are, um, it's not very well understood exactly which agent uh, uh, or combination of agent is related to the causation of lung cancer but the epidemiology is pretty clear. And on that, I'm going to close and um, thank you for your attention and uh, feel free to direct any questions uh, that um, you may have.